after Jordan recalled its ambassador over recent clashes and concerns that Israel may want to pass a law allowing Jews to pray at the site. We agree that we'll do every effort to make every effort to calm the situation. Uh, I explained to him that we're keeping the status quo on the Temple Mount and that uh, this includes Jordan's traditional uh, role there. As Netanyahu spoke, over a hundred far-right Jews marched near the site to call for their right to pray there. Under a decades-old accord to try and prevent friction, Jews are allowed to visit the site but not pray. The Palestinian foreign minister also called for calm. Uh, we are not interested really to enter into uh, a religious uh, war. Uh, um, the attack against Aqsa Mosque is uh, inviting to such uh, uh, type of dimension, which is really uh, difficult and, and dangerous to uh, contain. Clashes have broken out around Jerusalem in recent weeks. On Wednesday, two hit and runs by Palestinians injured pedestrians and killed a border policeman. Thousands attended his funeral on Thursday. In other world news, Libya's highest court has ruled that general elections held in June were unconstitutional and says the parliament and government which resulted from polls should be dissolved. The move has at widened divisions in politically divided Libya, which has been marred in months of clashes and turmoil. As Libya grapples with rival parliaments, there are fears the North African nation could ascend into yet more chaos. Since June, Libya has had two rival parliaments. One in Tripoli, backed by the Libya Dawn coalition of Islamist groups, and one recognised by the outside world, but forced into exile in the eastern city of Tobruk after the Islamists took over the capital. Now the Supreme Court has declared the internationally recognised one unconstitutional. This ruling means that the so-called parliament that is held in Tobruk has become a thing of the past and its decisions no longer have any meaning because the Libyans have now started on a new path towards constitutions, institutions and the rule of law. The decision sparked celebration on the streets of Tripoli. The mostly secular parliament had anyway been unable to impose its authority since it was elected in June, as Islamist militias control most of the country. Recent days have seen violent clashes between Islamist and pro-government groups in Libya's second city, Benghazi. Secular politicians say they won't accept the decision, saying the court had been hijacked by the militias. Well, for more on this story, I'm joined by our international affairs editor, Douglas Herbert. Doug, good morning to you. Good morning. We've heard about this uh, court decision in the package there. Isn't it slightly to make things on the ground a lot worse? Well, it already is making things worse. Uh, you know, we already have a situation in the country, as we just heard in that report. Essentially, you have rival parliaments, rival governments operating completely autonomously one of the other on opposite ends of the country, each backed by their own uh, security forces or armies or militias, what have you, each claiming uh, ultimate legitimacy. Um, and the situation has ha had showed absolutely no signs of resolving itself, if anything, getting worse. What this decision effectively is going to do, and let's remember that the decision was made in Tripoli, where a government not recognized by the international community, a government uh, that is really an alliance of warlords and Islamists, is based. Uh, and, and what it's going to do, it's probably going to harden their own claims to legitimacy. They've already been crying from every rooftop that they are the legitimate government based in the capital of the country uh, and that the internationally recognized government is based in the city of Tobruk. They couldn't even go to Benghazi because of the security situation there. The, so the government recognized is now likely to be pointing to this verdict as a sign of just how much all the institutions of the country are under the thrall of these Islamists and not and not legitimate in any way, shape or form, it's going to heighten their class, sharpen it. Doug, the claims that uh, by the court that these uh, elections weren't constitutional, what are they based on? Well, first of all, uh, they were based on the, the, what they did is they were saying that an amendment to the Constitution that allowed elections to take place in June, elections which resulted in this internationally re recognized government now based in the city of Tobruk, obviously not recognized by the Islamist-led government in uh, in Tripoli, uh, the court basically said that that amendment was invalid, uh, in, it was illegal, essentially meaning that the June elections which produced this internationally recognized government uh, is also invalid and illegal and not to be recognized. That's what's really at the heart of this verdict. But the question is the court itself. Let's not forget 
The court sat in Tripoli. As the court was making its verdict, by uh, its decision by all accounts, it was actually surrounded by uh, armed, armed men. Perhaps, we don't know exactly where they're from, but perhaps allied to uh, a lot of those Islamist militias um, that are basically behind the, the parliament in Tripoli. Uh, so that this court was basically under influence. The, the internationally recognized government in Tobruk says this is a politicized decision. It's not recognizing anything that comes out of it. And I will just note that the house of one of the judges of the Supreme Supreme Constitutional Court, who withdrew, who didn't want to participate in this decision, his house was attacked and torched, and this was put up on the uh, Facebook page of the uh, the internationally recognized parliament. Uh, Doug, if I can ask you an another question, perhaps moving away from that, a lot of the fighting is based on the, the vast energy resources, and a lot of the fighting is happening in the south. Absolutely. The south of the country, the Al Sharara uh, oil field, was actually stormed a couple of days ago, temporarily shut down. Oil is at the heart of almost all of this. Oil and water resources but mostly oil. Uh, you have basically a proxy fight going on in the South. They would have, uh, the, the narrative is that it's between a bunch of uh, uh, minority people that are fighting over access to the oil fields and the oil resources. It's really a proxy battle between the army forces, uh, loyal to the internationally recognized government mostly, and uh, the Islamist-led the militias, the warlords and their factions. They all want to get their hands on the oil. Let's not forget that protests, strikes had shut down these oil fields until May. They were re opened uh, last summer. Uh, Libya used to produce well, a million and a half or more barrels of oil a day. Giant industry there. It had dipped earlier this year to 200,000 barrels. Uh, officials now in the Tobruk government saying that they expect to get that up to about uh, a million barrels again, hopefully get back to 1.2 million barrels by the end of the year. Uh, but obviously, it's an OPEC member. It's a giant issue. Doug, just a final question. Let's talk about Benghazi. It's in yeah. the east. It's now considered one of the most dangerous places in the world. Uh, one of the most dangerous places. It's right now raging fighting there. Benghazi and another, Kikla, which is another city in the west, have been perhaps the epicenters of giant battles between the militia factions and the army forces. Um, and you've had basically hundreds of people get, there's estimates of 400 people who've been killed in recent weeks and months in the fighting in both of these cities. But you've had, the, the other numbers are countless have been wounded. You've had thousands and thousands displaced in this fighting. Uh, you have basically a former um, army general who is loyal to the uh, central army and the security forces trying to hold his own against uh, militia factions in Benghazi. The city is absolutely Absolutely. It's, it's a raging battleground, extremely dangerous. Medics have been evacuating people, citizens. You really can't walk the streets, uh, or if you do so, it's at the risk of your life. And you're absolutely right. It's, it's a, a reversal of fortune from the days when it was the birthplace of, yes, as you said, the revolution that overthrew uh, Muammar Gaddafi. So, wow, uh, it, quite a situation in Benghazi, and no, no signs of that subsiding anytime soon either. OK, Douglas Herbert, our international affairs editor, thanks very much for that analysis this morning. Washington said on Wednesday it had carried out airstrikes on the so-called Al-Qaeda link Khorasan group based in Syria as it was planning attacks on Europe or the US. David Rougillon, a uh, French-born militant and convert to Islam, was thought to be the target of those attacks. US officials claim the 24-year-old was the group's bomb maker, but neither Washington nor France has confirmed that Rougillon's death. While France Van Katz at Philip Crowther is in Washington with more on the US airstrikes which targeted the Khorasan group. Well, it's the return of this uh, Khorasan group that was first targeted by American airstrikes on the 22nd of September. That was the first wave of American airstrikes in Syria. Now, six weeks later, we have these five additional airstrikes in the area of Samada, that is uh, northeast of Idlib. And from what we're hearing from U.S. Central